Well, this is quite a, an exciting day uh, after this open house day that brought us so many new people and faces and so many discussions and conversations along the day. It's very exciting to be here and bring all this to discussing one particular practice, uh, that of Emmanuel Admasu, that it's incredibly important in, uh, in the school and I would say in, in, in the world now, I would say, uh, and I, I will explain myself. Uh, it, but I, I think it's great that we can do this today here because uh, this place stands and it's been standing for the possibility for architecture to be relevant in uh, transforming the world and not only architecture, but other practices, uh, 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 planning, preservation, uh, urban design, real estate. And, and I think that this is something that uh, very clearly it's what makes Emmanuel Admasu uh, such an important contributor to the school uh, to the fields in which he operates, mostly architecture and urban design, uh, but also to the world of culture and art at large. Uh, because Emmanuel Admasu is an architect and artist, uh, alongside his partner, Jim Wood, that also is a graduate from the school, he's a founder of ADWU, uh, a transnational practice that operates in New York, Addis Abeba, and Melbourne. And this transnational condition is not just an accident, I would say, but is owned by Emmanuel and by uh, his practice as a, as a way of being, as a way of being and existing as part of the world. Uh, he's also the co-founder and board member of the Black Reconstruction Collective, uh, alongside Mario Gooden, that is also here, and that you've, uh, uh, those that are coming today and those that are seeing us uh, in, on streaming uh, uh, have been uh, in touch with today. Uh, and of course, those that are part of the school know Mario very well as professor and also director of the MR program. He's, uh, Emmanuel is also a graduate from the school. And I remember him very well when I came here 10 years ago and you were already teaching and you were doing many things in the school and we had all these intense conversations in the corridors. And I think that that's something that shapes the place where we are as well, the possibility for these encounters and see how people evolve in time uh, as part of what we do. Uh, he's now a full-time professor at GSAP and he's teaching architecture and urban design. Uh, and he's previously taught at RE, uh, RISD and at the GSD. Emmanuel practice is incredibly complex. It's actually one, it's one of these practices that often people have a hard time to define <laughs> which I think is good. Uh, his work on installations, artworks, tap tapestries, uh, he's made basically, Adwo, together with his partner, occupy a space in the realm of arts. Uh, but also he's a researcher, and often we see his work published as architectural spatial research. Uh, and for instance, the work that he developed uh, on the marketplaces of the Cariaco in Dara, Dar es Salaam and the Mercato in Addis Abeba is something that basically help understand that the, the, all the compounds in Addis Abeba that I'm sure he will explain today, is something that basically allowed to understand how um, uh, the, the specific urbanisms uh, that have been developed in particular places like Addis Abeba or Dar es Salaam have escaped the capacity of, uh, globe, of the global north uh, to uh, account for uh, a big part of the spectrum of architectural practices and knowledge. Uh, also, he's done very extended research on the colonial, the persistence of, of colonial order in Atlanta, and he's extracted uh, actually a vocabulary that helps us to understand what is happening in architecture, and what is being happening, what is the way that we can confront coloniality in architecture now. Uh, but his writing is also, has also been incredibly uh, influential. Texts like Architecture Without Measure, Notes on Legibility with Yen Wu and Black Compound have actually helped understand what is the, uh, basically the, the way architecture is confronting uh, questions of coloniality and colonialism now and, and, structure, and how structural racism is being performed through architectural practices. Uh, but not only that, art, research, writing comes together with design. And uh, his practice, the practice that he runs uh, together with Jen Wood, Adwo, is also uh, building now exciting, I would say, single family and multifamily residential projects in Addis Abeba, 
And right now, and you were telling me now that it's about to uh, be published and already uh, open in a uh, new space in Williamsburg for light industries, but this, uh, I would say, legendary independent space for art and cinema in, in New York and Williamsburg. Um, but that comes together with uh, a large number of proposals that have been circulating in the last year in architectural media where basically he found other ways, uh, not necessarily constructing, to intervene architectural discourse. Something that of course has been widely celebrated and very influential even among our students here uh, and that I, I think that could, be, could not be understand if we don't see all the different layers of Emmanuel's practice. At, at the time that there was a general celebration of informality, Emmanuel challenged the idea of, Merc of the Mercato in Addis Abeba as, a, as saved by informality, but instead by a notion of form that is composed by technologies and temporalities, programs, and physicalities that require alternative discourses and representations, and that escape the urban and architectural descrip descriptions of Western traditions. Research, history, uh, buildings, and urban interventions uh, are part of a consistent project intended to, oper intended to operate in a space that has no conventional archives that is distributed, that is not contained by state borders. A practice that, in his own words, combines aggressive reinterpretations of history and radical imagination of the future. Something that I love about the Manuel writing is that he writes in first person. That's something that really, uh, uh, I, uh, really attracts me his voice is not an abstract voice of generic universal wisdom, but instead one situated in a particular history and in a social setting. In his article, Black Compound, he speaks as someone who shares an apartment in Providence, Rhode Island, with a kid and, a, a, and another person, who built his life by moving from Addis Abeba to Marietta, Georgia, as a teenager, who felt like falling into the rift that exists between Africa and the Americas. These international constellations of Afro-diasporic spaces are the sites where both his life and his work unfolds. He describes his art, design, and teaching practices as operating at the intersection of design theory, spatial justice, and contemporary African art. Atwood's work was featured in the 2021 exhibition Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in in America at the Museum of Modern Art curated by GISA professor Mabel Wilson and Sean Anderson. Their, their installation focuses on the immeasurability of black spatial practices in Atlanta. It explores the myriad ways in which black people have been imagining liberation within spaces of containment. Emmanuel's work inquires and confronts the long engagement of architecture in the liberating land and the world as something that can be measured, divided, and owned by establishing bodies and terrains and humans and nature as uh, independent, by imposing a modern logic of ownership, transparency, and measurability on indigenous, or, or, on indigenous cosmologies. Through the work of Emmanuel, architecture gains affinity with the words of Sylvia Winter, Edouard Glissant, Denise Ferreira da Silva, Tavian Jongo, uh, uh, Saidija Hartman. Emmanuel claims that architecture, voices that are so important now, I want to, to and voices that are somehow uh, coming through the walls of the auditorium that we are as, 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 as voices that are basically transforming everything that we do now. Emmanuel claims that architecture is a discipline that represents existing spatial conditions while imagining alternative futures, leaving projective imaginations aside it is critical that we begin to grapple with the ways in which architecture represents uh, and by ex extension erases existing spatial practices and conditions. Please join me uh, in celebrating Emmanuel Admasio here tonight. Uh, well, that, that was uh, a very serious introduction. Um, <laughs> so, um, so thank you, Dean Hake, for uh, this incredibly generous introduction, uh, but also for inviting me to give uh, the open house lecture in front of a lot of my heroes, um, teachers, uh, current students, 
um, and also folks who are thinking about joining us here at GSAT. Um, so no pressure. Um, I'll be presenting some work from uh, my practice, ADWO, um, in partnership with Jen Wood. And I just want to start off by acknowledging the fact that all of this work have, uh, relies heavily on Jen's uh, brilliance, talent, and generosity. Um, and our practice works in collaboration with uh, lots of people near and far, uh, especially a lot of people in Addis Ababa and Dar es Salaam. And uh, one of our current collaborators, a recent GSAP graduate, Jean Han, is also here. <laughs> um, so I'll present a few snippets uh, also from my teaching practice, just to um, think about uh, potential overlaps between the thinking we're doing in the practice and um, the ongoing experiments in pedagogy. Um, some of these thoughts will be clear and direct, while others will be somewhat uh, fragmentary and uh, oblique. So um, let's get started. Mati Diop's 2019 film, Atlantics, um, is a story about a ghost generation a generation of youth uh, that disappeared in the sea as they were attempting to cross over to Europe. But instead of telling uh, the story from the standpoint of the young men who continued to depart from the coast of Senegal, she focused on the women who were left behind. We are interested in spatial practices that function as vectors opening up space for new readings of historic and contemporary conditions. The migration of people and artifacts across the Atlantic, the search for refuge and opacity, thinking with Daniela Johannes's work on geographies of migration on the left to consider what is lost um, in transit and what is left behind. The earth becomes our skin. Sami Baloji's images of the small-scale mining practices that have replaced industrial mining sites in the Democratic Republic of Congo are reminders of the various ways in which coloniality limits our ability to see. By refusing to present uh, a single story or a direct solution to complex and multi-layered problems, we rehearse ways of positioning ourselves against the forced transparency of the ethnographic gaze. We are interested in making images uh, that are suspended between abstraction and figuration, multivocal and at times dissenting ways of making and occupying space. But a lot of our work asks who gets to do the measuring and under what circumstances. This um, is a map of the African continent drawn by an American anthropologist uh, who had never visited the continent. It is of course a much more fragmented image of Africa than the one we've grown accustomed to but even in this attempt to acknowledge multiplicity beyond the obvious inaccuracies, like most car cartographic projects, um, it renders static borders. Inversely, Ashil Mbembe notes how uh, pre-colonial African boundaries were not established to limit movement, but to intensify interactions between multiple tribes. Therefore, one of the core tenets of the colonial state is finding ways to contain the natives that are constantly on the move. So colonial cartography will always fail to measure um, the myriad ways in which these landscapes have been and continue to be indigenized. 
Moving across the Atlantic, um, this is a map of the state of Georgia in 1861, measuring the percentage of enslaved Africans in each county. Again, merging the measurement of land with the measurement of black life, both rendered as property. Our ongoing project in measurability attempts to trace the seams between the material and immaterial conditions generated by the two previous maps. The singular worldview that has produced our current uh, world order. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge serves as an ontological frame, articulating a set of spatial practices that work against the regimes of measurement and quantification imposed by coloniality and racial capitalism. It identifies a relational zone uh, between landforms and people that remain tethered to one another. Sylvia Winter describes the current permutation of the human as homo economicus, acknowledging eco economics as the dominant discipline of our time a hegemonic world order that took over from religion. She even describes economists as being priestly in their influence over mankind, and more specifically in their influence over regimes of valuation, rendering African bodies and land as sites of extraction that feed European and North American sites of accumulation. This is coupled with her critique of the biocentric logic, a racial regime that locks meaning and value with biology. As a countermeasure to this biocentric logic, she proposes a conception of the human, borrowing from Fanon, as a hybrid between bios and mythoi, genetic codes and non-genetic codes. What she describes as the non-genetic or the sociogenic principles our proclivities to fashion ourselves through myths and narratives, origin stories. I'm particularly fascinated by this formulation because I come from a nation state that understands itself through a seemingly exceptional origin story. It, man it maintains symbolic importance in the Pan-African imaginary as the only African nation that was able to successfully resist European colonization. But this preservation of sovereignty required a more regional form of imperialism. The Amharic word dimber connotes an amorphous landmass demarcated by its natural features. The Amharic word gubbi connotes a, sm a smaller territory surrounded by a wall or a fence. These multi-scalar notions of fluctuating territory help us understand the fleeting urban form of Addis Ababa, how people claim territory and how territory is either solidified or compromised. Shortly after the first Italo-Ethiopian War, Empress Aitu and Emperor Menelik moved and settled on a mountaintop in the center of what became a new nation state. Topography has significantly determined the urban form of the city of Addis Ababa, settled as a temporary military camp for the Ethiopian empire. A nodal network of houses for army generals and lieutenants radiates out from the rural compound on adjacent hilltops, militarizing the topography. These rivers and gibbies on hilltops still anchor the main neighborhoods of the city. This atomized sovereignty is augmented by a social framework that is porous and amorphous. At its core, uh, the Gibby is a defensive typology. It has a clearly defined edge containing a series of varied indoor and outdoor spaces. It is a zone of respite and relative stability carved out of an errant and restless city. I grew up in a Gibbi in Addis Ababa, a zone that is constantly penetrated by neighbors, friends, 
relatives and their loved ones. Providing intimate communal environments for long and short term occupants. A variety of materials are used to fence in the plots. Eucalyptus trunks, corrugated sheets, metal grills, stone, and masonry. Good bees contain houses, parks, schools, gardens, spaces of worship, and commerce. They host events such as weddings, wakes, religious rituals, and celebrations. The boundary of the good bee has literal and metaphorical depth. It is not a line on a map, but a zone of contestation, pushed and pulled by shifts in politics, culture, and economy. It is a repository of the city's history. The contemporary construction sites of Mercato could be read as practices in defending the perimeter. Fortified at their base with transient rings of merchant stalls, abbreviations of what the stalls were and will be, maintain relationships between long-standing customers during the extensive construction periods uh, of the new malls. The buildings under construction are crowned with ephemeral envelopes made of tarp and eucalyptus scaffolding. All land in Ethiopia is owned by the state and leased by collectives and individuals. In most cases, that this has intensified real estate speculation, but it has also introduced a level of unpredictability and mutability that is different from Western notions of property. Over the past few years, we have been designing a series of projects that interpret the spatial and social conditions found in these everyday spaces. The Gibby is the most ubiquitous residential typology in Ethiopia. These are experiments in imagining alternative futures for the Gibby. One of our first projects as a practice was a large compound uh, that had a series of existing buildings. Two houses for siblings are returning home after having lived in the United States for decades. So we designed a very simple landscape and canopy strategy, cohering uh, the two new additions with the existing structures on the site. The contemporary transformations of the Gibby throughout Addis Ababa reflect materializations of the diaspora condition, namely uh, the contradictions embedded in the desire and the impossibility of the return. This project is a microcosm of cross-generational exchange materialized through a post and beam frame and filled with either glass or stone that matches the existing compound wall. And we have continued to explore uh, these ideas through various design projects, testing expanded definitions of kinship uh, that go well beyond the boundaries of the site. The Gibby is currently being updated to match an increasing demand uh, for density. In my lifetime, the population of Ethiopia has almost doubled. Uh, the median age in Ethiopia um, is less than 20 years old. Therefore, the population will continue to grow exponentially. So we've been experimenting with ways of stacking the good beasts uh, of Addis Ababa to design uh, these multifamily residential buildings. And the mild climate of Addis uh, allows for an exchangeable set of indoor and outdoor rooms and a great degree of spatial fluidity uh, throughout the year. This project uh, simply responds to the two meter zoning offset uh, required by the city. And the, the building has a similar organizational profile in plan and in section, allowing for two hemispheres that are wrapped uh, with a brick screen salvaged from villas that are currently being demolished throughout Addis Ababa. So uh, by stretching the compound wall to the height of six stories, um, we were able to create a garden matrix between the compound wall and the building proper. 
and the brick screen is conceptualized as a vertical tapestry with uh, staggered openings. The four sides of uh, the building are slightly different versions of that tapestry in response to extended negotiations with neighbors and uh, the municipality. And those slight misalignments uh, between the openings on the building proper and the apertures in the brick screen offer varied lighting conditions um, on each floor of the apartment building. This project is currently under construction. Um, this is a picture we took this summer and we just finished pouring the second floor slab a few days ago. So uh, fingers crossed. Thinking about this piece, uh, Libretto by Charles Gaines, Fred Moten writes, I'm interested in what can't be finished or cleared up. The unpayable debt, the unaccountable. The monk-like discipline of the artist Charles Gaines, who for the most part works in series, produces work that is rigorously systematic and intellectual, playing with language while resisting interpretation. This work superimposes excerpts from an opera by Manuel de Falla with a speech by Kwame Ture, AKA Stokely Carmichael. Large-scale tapestries have given us a medium uh, to examine some of the most fundamental questions of architecture. And Charles Gaines's work has been instructive in helping us think about the liminal space between codes and experiences, especially when it comes to representing the two marketplaces uh, we've been working on, Kari Dar Salaam and Mercato and Adesawa. So one of the first tapestries we produced um, traces the temporal materials that have been used to build the marketplace over the past 80 years, collapsing Mercato into 126 scenes and learning from the notational systems developed by Charles Gaines for his Numbers and uh, Trees series. So this is the tapestry, um, the Mercato tapestry, which was commissioned uh, by the African Mobilities Exhibition curated by Mpoma Tsipa. And I would say that we're, we're still searching for ways to think about um, the history of Mercato, both as a materialization of a racialized colonial imaginary and a space for uh, collective resistance. Eucalyptus framing, corrugated metal sheets, uh, sliding doors and metal shutters offer details of resistance against the tyranny of permanence imposed by the development paradigm. I would say that the origin story of Dar es Salaam could be understood as a counterpoint to the origin story of Addis Ababa. Many of the buildings in Kari Ako, uh, have formal and material qualities that echo architectural details from across the Indian Ocean. Reflect, reflecting the rich history of movement and exchange between South Asia and East Africa. But Dar es Salaam's proximity to the Indian Ocean has also rendered it valuable and therefore vulnerable to various imperialist regimes. Multiple types of boats, ships, and tankers are employed in the choreographed extraction of resources and labor from the hinterlands across the ocean. So in order to understand this a little bit further, we've been documenting the Cartesian units of measurement imposed to facilitate this uh, colonial extraction and how those systems of measurement uh, prefigure the urban form of specific neighborhoods in Dar es Salaam. Uh, for example, this uh, nine by nine meter grid of the coconut farm established by Sultan Majid bin Said of Zanzibar in 1862, pretty much initiated uh, a regime of measurability on Dar es Salaam. The land, its people, and resources have since been allotted to quantifiable units. The coconut farm transformed into plots for single-family homes for indigenous Africans, 
within the racially segregated master plan uh, that was designed by the German colonial regime and in place eventually by the British. But even the name, the name Karya Co uh, is a Swahiliized derivation of Care Corps Depot, a generic industrial shed used by German and British troops during the First World War. But after independence on January 25th, 1967, um, a few years after the nation gained independence, the Pan-Africanist leader, uh, the first president of Tanzania, Julius Nyerere, introduced his political philosophy of Ujamaa, promoting egalitarianism, socialism, and self-reliance. The Kariko Market Hall is an open-air structure shaded by 24 concrete funnels, each spanning 15 meters that harvest rain and facilitate passive cooling for the three platforms of trading spaces below. Designed by Tanganyikan architect Beta Amuli, the market hall canopy recalls the coconut trees under which markets were held in the past. But it is also an animist enactment of Ujamaa. For the past few years, I've been co-editing a book um, with curator and art historian Anita Bateman called Where's Africa? It is an anthology of interviews, essays, and commissioned artworks. Slated to be published by the Center for Art Research and Alliances, CARA, early next year. The book offers opportunities to expand the vocabulary we use to theorize African cities and aesthetic practices. The book is designed by the incredible uh, Nancy Kalolo Mutiti and has 24 contributors in total, uh, interviews and original interventions, essays and artworks. I don't want to uh, ruin the surprise, uh, but the foreword is written by someone we all know and admire very much, who might be in this room. Uh, this project uh, was generated from my own frustrations with the myopic nature of uh, contemporary architectural discourse. So the project really engages in an interdisciplinary and transnational conversation with contemporary artists, curators, and designers. Uh, and whereas Africa really begins by accepting the premise that uh, placemaking is an elusive endeavor in post-colonial contexts. And instead, it proposes an elastic definition of geographic and disciplinary positioning to engage in conversations with people that are actively making Africa, both within and outside its geographic boundaries. By examining artist collectives, uh, new currents in art history, and the use of contemporary art uh, festivals, um, or specifically the rise of contemporary art uh, festivals in and about Africa uh, from the past 10 years. So instead of forging a unified image of a vast and culturally limitless region, the book is concerned with questions of access, movement, and transformation as compulsory imperatives to a sustained and critical discourse on contemporary cultural production. And I would say the aim is still to disrupt uh, epistemological tendencies that address contradictions within neo-colonial discourse without articulating the subversive agency of colonized people and places. And these conversations led us from Providence to New York City, Dar es Salaam, Addis Ababa, Boston, and Johannesburg in search of the connective tissue that links people of African descent across the diaspora through uh, visual culture and a shared commitment to authorial reclamation. These conversations were punctuated by a public event that was held at the Rhode Island School of Design. And the book release will be accompanied by a series of public events uh, here in New York City, in Dar es Salaam and Addis Ababa. Um, and the aim is to develop uh, an iterative set of conversations that interrogate dominant perceptions of Africa and its diaspora. So if Whereas Africa asks us how we position ourselves in relation to specific geographies, histories, and disciplines, 
Our ongoing research on the urban marketplaces in East Africa has also been shaped through a series of conversations and collaborations across disciplines and geographies. And one of the earliest articulations of this was uh, the stop motion animation. This is a still from it um, that we did in collaboration with the artist Ezra Rube. And this collaboration was really an opportunity to think through questions of temporality across various disciplines and practices of image making. And we produced uh, the narratives and drawings and Ezra was translating them into uh, animated scenes with soundscapes that he recorded in the marketplace. It was a fluid process that allowed us to go beyond uh, the static conventions of architectural representation. And we've continued to think about uh, these marketplaces at the regional scale um, beyond the nation state. And this is the first encounter upon entering the two markets exhibition uh, we made in 2019. And our installation uh, really functions as a nonlinear collection of uh, spatial fragments from Kari Ko and Mercato. Uh, but specifically misalignments between the colonial imaginary and local resistance has been central to this research um, on the social spatial identities of the marketplaces, producing images and artifacts that narrate the fragmented history of uh, Dar es Salaam and Addis Ababa. So the aim is always to identify difference uh, within a context that is often rendered as homogenous. And these two markets have radically different social and spatial uh, identities due to their varied engagements with coloniality. For example, uh, we've been imaging how the fragmentation of uh, Dar es Salaam has registered at the scale of the city block in Karyako. How the gaps resulting from the unitization of Karyako by the coconut grid are being redefined. We've been thinking about the neo-colonial implications of contemporary transit systems, what they connect and what they divide. We've been attempting to trace uh, the growing influence of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and how it is producing a national and continental network of transportation infrastructure that is almost exclusively being built by the Chinese government. the multinational tech companies that are shaping the urban form of contemporary cities in Africa, the failure of Western banking systems and the global battle for next generation 5G networks, but we've also been trying to document various forms of collective ownership in Mercato um, that produce mega blocks of resistance against land speculation. And we're also interested in the instability of monuments. Uh, these instabilities offer opportunities to, for shifts in politics and culture. How a building that was designed um, as a demonstration of individual wealth in a feudalist society becomes a symbol or a monument for a socialist military junta. The, the, ver the various overlaps of religion and commerce, uh, which is apparent throughout the city, but especially on this block uh, where the biggest mosque in uh, the city shares a wall with one of the biggest churches in the middle of Mercato. And in both cases, uh, the urban marketplace is a microcosm of the nation. And they present various aspirations of sovereignty. Um, and we're, we're attempting to conceptualize these African marketplaces as spaces to envision a form of liberation that is yet to be achieved. In line with this work, we also understand that world making after property requires collective imagination. This semester, I'm teaching with a brilliant group of colleagues and students um, in the urban design program. 
Our studio titled Atlanta After Property challenges students to identify samples, temporal slippages and spatial practices that carve out moments of liberation from the limits of property. And the studio is framed around a central question. Um, how can we disentangle architecture and urban design from property? Last spring, um, I taught a studio called After Images, and the studio engages with the ongoing global debates over the vast collections of looted African artifacts uh, that are contained in European and North American museums. These debates, augmented by scholarly and artistic interventions, are calling attention to critical questions. What can the museum become when it ceases to be an after image of coloniality? And how can we use this moment of protests, strikes, and direct actions at museums as counterpoints to the ossification of Western art institutions? In other words, what would it mean for an art institution to genuinely engage with notions of restitution, animism, and diasporic placemaking? So uh, finally, returning to the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and Mati Diop's Atlantics. The non-dialectical thinker and philosopher Edward Glissant speaks about the transparency of the cinematic image what is left outside the frame is critical. He states that the Atlantic is a mausoleum. It forces us to find ourselves in relation with the other. And as uh, Dean Hake noted, Tavian Nyong'o describes Afrofabulation as, and I quote, the ghost note, the unplayed note that is virtually heard by the trained and expectant ear. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the longest mountain range on the planet, is situated on the ocean floor between Africa and the Americas. And it is the ghost note uh, for the birth of racial capitalism and the partition of the planet. It cannot be captured by satellite imagery, submerged deep below the water surface, hidden by 500 years of history yet to be carefully excavated. Our work for the exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art um, titled Reconstructions, Architecture and Blackness in America, uh, curated by our very own Mabel Wilson and Sean Anderson, focuses on the overlaps between Atlanta and the Atlantic. The curators commissioned uh, 10 artists and designers to produce work that analyzes how anti-blackness has and continues to shape 10 American cities. But an important um, legacy of the show is the formation of the BRC, the Black Reconstruction Collective, uh, which is a nonprofit organization started by the 10 of us uh, to provide funding, design, and intellectual support uh, for the ongoing and incomplete project of emancipation uh, for the African diaspora. I won't reiterate this, but as stated earlier, my transatlantic move from Addis Ababa to Marietta, Georgia as a teenager felt like falling uh, into the rift that exists between Africa and the Americas. And I left um, the comfort of a Gibby in a bustling African capital and entered into a quiet subdivision uh, in a northern suburb of Atlanta. But my move was also an embodied transformation uh, and transition uh, from a distant and relatively abstract understanding of one's place in the world to a direct confrontation with the hierarchies that shape and maintain it. Architecture tends to concretize existing regimes of power. Thus, its commitment to measurement and transparency is always already tied to subjugation and control. Peter Gordon's etching of Savannah, Georgia in 1734, establishing the colony of Georgia in America, is an explicit depiction of this tendency. His etching can be read as a foundational diagram for the spatial practices of settler colonialism. 
the dispossession of land from indigenous people, the clearing of the forest, that was eventually followed by the conversion of that land into measurable units of property. These ideas operate in contradistinction to various indigenous cosmologies, both here and elsewhere, which for thousands of years have been predicated on the belief that land is sacred and communal. It cannot be measured, owned, and divided. It requires collective stewardship and care. And these questions of property and the ways in which we measure and share the planet were fundamental to uh, the project and measurability. So again, instead of focusing on the systems that devalue black life, we were really interested in sites of collectivity and abundance, uh, the various ways in which black people practice and measurability. But the installation we produced um, for reconstructions is fundamentally a prototype. Um, it's simply the beginning of a long research project which attempts to think about and find language to represent black spatial practices that remain illegible to architecture and urban design. And these are systems that are uh, not strictly tethered to power and capital. So it's an attempt to look beyond, above, and below uh, disciplinary boundaries of measurement. And we're looking at uh, these everyday spaces of black life, which offer conditions or possibilities for the dissolution of property. We modeled uh, the built environments in the predominantly black neighborhoods of Atlanta. And as you can imagine, by and large, these are environments made of the same fragments that you see in most American urban and suburban contexts, uh, strip malls, highways, and single family homes. But we wanted to start our experiments in representation by doing a series of uh, image and material studies that conceptualize black spatial practices between flow and form. Uh, we were interested in the slow material transformations from sand to glass. Um, and, you know, the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge itself um, is very much a site for the formation of blackness, um, but it also prefigures a global black aesthetic. And one of the materials found on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge uh, is a magnetic black sand called magnetite. And this particular finding really helped us focus our experiments. So we decided to use magnetite to model um, the black quotidian spaces of Atlanta. And we were working with a group of glass artists at RISD um, in the glass department, testing various combinations of black sand with accelerators, um, soda ash, cobalt, and glass powder. And we started this work by accepting um, really architecture's sublime temporality, not its pretensions of permanence. So we were also thinking about ongoing practices of refusal that transform spaces of subjugation into spaces of black joy. I show this image a lot. Um, this is an image of Paperboy Lost in the Woods. And for us, it was really interesting to think about um, the woods of Atlanta as spaces um, for black and indigenous imagination. And again, um, Following Sylvia Winter, one could say it is a site that is um, tethered between the plot and the plantation, freedom and enclosure, uh, fugitivity and captivity. So we were also tracing how these environments keep reappearing in popular culture, uh, from TV shows to uh, music videos from and about Atlanta. And we wanted to uh, zoom into specific spaces um, in the city, 
And these image st studies were experiments uh, with the overlaps between these generic kind of chain restaurants that appear in the clearings within the forest. And the types of um, interactions and um, communities that are formed there. But we're also very much thinking about the mythical within the ordinary. And the installation um, is made up of two disks, uh, one horizontal and one vertical, both six feet in diameter. The horizontal disk, as I mentioned earlier, is a dynamic model of everyday spaces in Atlanta. And these are a series of fragments showing a day in the life of a person uh, modeled as bricks. And the magnetite sand shifts between uh, the bricks activated by a series of magnetic robots below the glass disc. And the vertical disc is a tapestry of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, um, considering historic and ongoing Afro-diasporic migration. And this is a detail of the tapestry documenting the slow and often painful process of converting vectors into threads. But um, as we were looking at the Atlantic, we were also thinking about the ways in which it is miniaturized and reproduced at the scale of the city. Um, Atlanta was settled as a determinus for state-sponsored railway lines. So those railway lines eventually transformed into highway infrastructure, but they produced the same effect of segregating the predominantly white North Atlanta from the predominantly black South Atlanta. And on the left is a detail of uh, the horizontal disk um, with fragments of the city. And on the right is a detailed tapestry. This was also a really great opportunity for us to collaborate with um, young artists in the city. And we worked with a musician um, from Atlanta called Tafari Williams, who composed a 24 minute soundscape, one minute for uh, every hour of the day. And this followed the loose narrative that was established um, to lay out the bricks on the horizontal disk. In section the cone, um, the bottom of the cone um, housed the speakers and the Raspberry Pi. And the top shelf um, was used to anchor these rails with the robots uh, that would be shifting the sand. And on the wall, we had uh, these two collages um, presenting a landscape that is somewhere between um, the mythical and the ordinary. Thank you. this wonderful presentation of this like very provocative body of work. I'm going to try and say something articulate um, that hopefully is interesting as well. <laughs> I, I, I think one of the first things that I want to say is that there's, there's this way in which in your work you move between the, um, the personal and the political with such seamlessness, one doesn't even notice. And, um, you know, of course, I think the example, the instance of that, that I, I, every, I think everyone is most, most mesmerized by is the, is the ridge is, mm -hmm. and, and I found fascinating that it's, you know, both ridge and rift, mm -hmm. you know, an abyss that you fall mm -hmm. into, but also a kind of mountain that you have mm -hmm. to scale. Um, and, uh, but, but, uh, but I think what it does is it really reminds us that the border is not a line that you cross, but really a conceptual 
um, a conceptual sort of idea that in in crossing it becomes a part of you, mm -hmm. and uh, where where once you cross that border, and I have that same experience, you are always bordered. You know, yeah. you are always carrying the border with you, and then you are um, an outsider everywhere. Mm -hmm. You're just uh, always uh, always outside. Um, but then that outsideness gives you certain capacity to then mm -hmm. um, speak in hopefully you know mm -hmm. critical and interesting ways um, but but it's it's a, it's a it's a complicated position to it's a complicated position to um, inhabit this 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 sort of bordered um, experience of the planet um, I think one of my central sort of comment observation questions is about um, the way in which your work is infrastructural. Mm -hmm. um, what I, what I, what I, uh, try and get it all so that I don't forget any of the pieces. Okay, so uh, what do I mean when I say that? Uh, one, one of the things that, you know, you sort of bring up in your work is how um, capital has a way to find what is uh, valuable and thus make it vulnerable. I think you talk about that in relation to um, uh, the Karyakko. The, the, the yep. mm -hmm. Gosh, I've, and I've been trying to figure out how to spell it so I can Google it. And I, <laughs> I, I, I can't. <laughs> the Karyakko uh, relationship of the market to the port and, mm -hmm. and how, uh, and, and, I, I, and you have the drawing of that. Um, and, and you know, in that sense, both that and the Belt and Road Initiative uh, occupy very normative definitions of infrastructure as that which you know move commodities yeah. over space across space. Um, but at the same time, infrastructure also has a temporality to it, a very different temporality from the one that you talk about. And that is, I think we can talk about this temporality as infrastructure is constantly promising a better future. Mm -hmm. But in the act of promising this better future, it's commodifying the future. You know, it's sort of like futures or speculation. And there are all of these ways that infrastructure um, commodifies the future before we even imagine it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there's an additional contradiction. Oh, well, I want you know. It, I think key key to this in relation to some of the things you said is about you know the age of the Tanzanian and Ethiopian population. That the young people and so mm -hmm. these these infrastructural projects are really um, aiming to kind of capitalize on yeah. that on their future, mm -hmm. uh, extract in in, a, in both extracting and uh, creating a market. You know, yeah. two, two ways. Um, so this sort of act of colonizing the future before we can even uh, think it is, is in contradiction with this other aspect of infrastructure, which is that it makes this promise, but it never actually fulfills that promise. Mm -hmm. It's a mm -hmm. continuously deferred mm -hmm. promise. And we know this so much because we are inhabiting um, the ruins, the future, the ruined future of past mega, mega projects, yeah. you know, which is that sort of <clears throat> world making post colonial developmental moment that uh, was seized both South Asia, Africa in the, in, in the you know, post war period. So here we have infrastructural projects that make these deferred, continually deferred promises, these promises that never pay out. And in contrast to that, there's a way that your work is refusing that future. Mm -hmm. And instead, investing in the radical uncertainty of the present, you know. And uh, I, I, I think I was really taken by this idea of uncertainty that you commit to, and it. I, I think it's m to me most um, evident in the Gebi, mm -hmm. which you recognize as having a tendency to block and also having a tendency to with to yeah. hold. Um, and you, you, you never try to resolve that tension, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, in, in a sense, that's my observation slash question, which is, how do we how do we imagine this in a present rather than you know because it, it, even in our studio, your after property, we are it, it, this is not some future, right? We're already mm -hmm. we already want to be after property. Yeah. Um, so there's a sort of use of language that is future oriented, but it is always turned inward. And this, I, I and I think the one thing I want is a verb for immeasurability. Because to measure is a practice. I need that too, I need that too. Yeah, so right, right. Because when you find it, just 
<laughs> we have sure, to make it sure. up. Uh, but it, because you think you 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 always talk about immeasurability as a practice, not mm-hmm. as a as a characteristic or a, or, or a, a, I, I have many other thoughts, but I'm going <laughs> to pause over there and maybe turn it over to um, mm-hmm. Andres or. Oh, I mean, uh, how should we how should we do this? Do you want to respond or? What, 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 which part of the question? I mean, I, um, I want. <laughs> hey, I, 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 I have, a, I have a question, and it is that: how do we, how, how do we invest in this radically uncertain present? How do we even find languages to talk about it? How would you describe that, um, that that mo- that kind of um, condition? And in a way, I think what you're saying is that that's the that's. Not, not a manifesto, but that's how architectural thinking is going to, it's not going to be um, a project of technocratic problem solving, looking to make a better future, because that is already a ruined project, it's a ruined future. So what kind of language, what kind of thinking, what kind of new ways do we then how, do we use to sort of inhabit this radically mm-hmm. uncertain present? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, I mean, I, I think okay. So that's that's a very hard question, and I, I'll just start by saying, I think maybe for me the uncertainty is a good way to check ourselves, um, because even in the sh- the work that I was sharing, there are moments where we feel like it's becoming complacent in response to these regimes. So the uncertainty puts us in a position where we're not committing to those, um, to those futures. But it also allows us to be a lot more agile and spontaneous. And um, quite frankly, the, the, the work that we do in Addis is in intense collaboration with a practice called Yema. Um, and they're kind of a media practice as well. So they're always thinking about city, they, ho- they host radio shows and have these weekly debates about the future of the city. Um, so just being in conversation with them forces us to, to not commit to uh, a clear answer, but to somehow remain in this space of uncertainty and, and discomfort. Um, yeah, but, but it's, it's really difficult, I would say, because I think there are certain things that are very appealing, you know? Um, when it comes to speaking about these cities. And when you're talking about the infrastructure conversation in Addis, there was a light rail system that was inaugurated less than 10 years ago, which was kind of like a huge deal. You know, they, they built it in like four years, um, but they didn't train anyone in Ethiopia to manage it. So now another five years removed, the whole thing is defunct. So I think there needs to be ways for us for us to remain engaged, but also maintain the space of uncertainty and discomfort. Mm-hmm. Um. Well, uh, this has been an amazing lecture. I want to, to say this to start with. Uh, and in many different ways, I think that uh, it was the way you constructed the moments uh, in which information could emerge uh, was very, very carefully a stage, I would say, uh, so that there was no, never the impression that you were providing this kind of simple solution, mm-hmm. right, or direct solutions. Uh, I, I think that when we look at the last work and the images that you selected to conclude are images that are sort of uh, providing an atmosphere in which it, it's difficult to say how successful the project of mm-hmm. measurement is. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's the images are decomposing that capacity of those orders to impose themselves. Mm-hmm. And the spaces and realities that you're mentioning and, and reflecting on seem to be kind of making their way uh, mm-hmm. uh, through the kind of incapacity and failure of measurability, you know. And, mm-hmm. and they constitute themselves as something that is actually not that transparent, not that easy to explain, yeah. not really something that can be. Uh, explain with simple words, right? Mm-hmm. And I wonder what is the status of the project of property and measurability and control and colonialism at this point, from your point of view? Because it seems <laughs> that your lecture is operating in the failure. You, I, I love that they was talking about the ruins of this mm-hmm. kind of 
And somehow it seems that the rings are basically what we inhabit. And the rings are not exactly the same that the successful project. You know, I have the feeling that there's uh, an, a failure. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that we're combating, combating something or confronting something that is incredibly successful. It's that the structure of property, the structure of measurability, the structure of transparency are structures that are, have failed. Yeah, and that we're inhabiting in the basically this failure. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I mean, to me, what's really interesting about it is how it makes people really uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, like we students, some of, some of the students from Urban Design are here today, but there were some people in our panel today, guest critics, who were very uncomfortable with the idea of giving up property. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a certain attachment that we have to property as this thing that somehow gives us stability, gives us a future, um, and lets us coexist with each other. Yes. Um, and I think when we are really seriously looking at the history and how it has shaped and maintained the current world order, we know that it doesn't do that. Yes. But yet we're so attached to it. and. It's difficult to have that conversation here. It's even more difficult to have that conversation in Ethiopia. Um, so for me, it becomes an entry point to begin to understand where people's anxieties are coming from mm -hmm. and how that might shape the future of the city. Um, we don't have a silver bullet. <laughs> we don't have a single solution. But at, at least from, from a pedagogical standpoint for us, it was, it's been interesting um, to one, come up with multiple uh, definitions of property, but then also come up with multiple uh, strategies and tactics to begin to dissolve uh, mm -hmm. the regime. Um, I think it's been a really generative environment to think about the built environment because it also shows the limits of form um, and materiality. So, so, yeah, like basically we need to come up with a new way of relating to one another and sharing space that will produce some sort of spatial practice. But what that, what that becomes, I'm not, I don't know if, if I have an answer for. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, on, this, on, the, on the subject of property, I think what, the way in which you in, engage the historical literature on um, the emergence of property regimes uh, makes the case that property is something we designed. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, is it possible then to design something different? Yeah. So, you know, because I think that's really the historical case you're making. Look at how we designed this world and therefore mm -hmm. can we not design something else? Yeah. Um, and it really, as much as it feels impossible, you know, to have a world without property for, for students, especially if they're coming in and, you know, have not imagined that that's a thing at all or not yeah. engage that historical discourse. Uh, I can see how it is. It, but but. It, Maybe this is an unfair question, but is there something about property that you've learned from, you know, because I think you've taught the studio like maybe three times or something <laughs> yeah. like that. Maybe there's something you've learned about property that from students themselves that might be some, something interesting. I don't know. Um, I mean, you know, we, we just want, I think, you know, I do this, we do this in my practice <laughs> and there's always a certain urge to look for an anchor mm -hmm. and that anchor has been kind of community land trust, and we know the limits of that and the failures of that. So I think for us, it's been interesting, even if we engage with the community land trust conversation very directly and engage with nonprofits that are doing that work on the ground, that automatically changes the way we draw the city. So at least for, for, you know, for our purposes in the studio and in our practice, our initial ambition is finding ways to image the world differently, and hopefully that will produce different types of interventions. But even being able to, to see the world beyond property is a challenge. Yeah. <laughs> and I think for the most part, that's been the challenge of the studio. Um, and, you know, it, it happened mostly because we were doing this research on, uh, for, for <laughs> the exhibition uh, for reconstructions, and we just kept running up against the same issue. We know, we know what happens to these cities. Mm 
We know what happens the moment you put in a park. We know what happens the moment you make it accessible to mass transportation. All of it causes some form of dispossession or removable, removal. And the removal is usually directed at working class black and brown people. Yeah. So I think that's, that's fundamentally what forced us to begin to engage with this as an urban design issue. And hopefully that will, that will produce something else. And, and how is, I mean, you're basically operating in different context in a way, and that's, that provides you the great opportunity to see how different contexts react to transferences of experience, knowledge, ideas, and, uh, and, and I'm very curious uh, along these lines and the question that the was uh, 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 asking, uh, to the experience of the Boller Rwanda Street project, uh, this possibility of turning the compound into something mm -hmm. vertical uh, and that it's so generous in the uh, in-between spaces and it's creating all these ambiguities in the circulations mm -hmm. and the, and the, proper, the limits of properties. Uh, and, and I wonder what's the way that you're uh, negotiating uh, with the forces that basically come when it, uh, you know, when, when you're doing a, an arc a building itself and, the, and that somehow are probably the, the forms of resistance to uh, property, to alternatives to property or to art more rigid in a way or kind mm -hmm. of stronger. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder what is the, uh, the, I mean, for me, it would be great to, to know from your experience, what is the way that you see opportunities for architectural practices when it comes to design buildings to, to operate and negotiate and challenge notions of property, accumulation, uh, and even uh, the collective, right? Like the limits yeah. to, the, to, 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 the, to the capacity to imagine alternative ways of collectiveness. Um, I mean, to be quite frank, I think that's, <laughs> that's the fundamental contradiction in our practice right now, uh, because we, we love buildings, we wanna keep designing buildings, but a lot of that work, especially Boli Rwanda, was designed before we even started the research mm. on property. Um, but it was designed at a moment where we were really looking at the Gibby very seriously. And so now we're at this moment where we're trying to negotiate the contradiction between, you know, a close reading of an existing context, which might not have anything to do with property, and the, the kind of more recent interest in thinking about property. Um, I will say we're continuing the research on the Gibby. And now that we're continuing the research on a Gibby for another exhibition, we're now looking at it through the lens of property. Mm -hmm. So hopefully that'll produce something else. Um, but it is, and that's why we keep saying, I feel like whenever <laughs> I present our work, I say we, our practice is committed to image making um, because I think that we can control and we can control the discourse around the images we make. But when we were at that construction site for the apartment building, I was basically discovering all of the things that we can't control. Mm. So um, for me, that's, that's humbling and productive, mm -hmm. <laughs> but it also doesn't mean that we don't, we, that we have to stop doing the other work, you know? And that other work has hopefully helped us imagine a world beyond that apartment building and beyond the ways in which the city is currently structured. But we also want to engage with the present um, through design. So yeah, I don't, I don't really have a resolution for that contradiction, but that is, that is the issue. I mean, it's fascinating because in Ethiopia, this was an experiment that was tried, yeah. that the state yeah. owns, mm -hmm. well, that's just, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. And yet property as a concept persists through kind of legal yes. manipulations yeah. and through um, formal operations yeah. um, and sort of reemerges. So, mm -hmm. so there's, there's a kind of, and, and clearly this state owning, state owning all of the land is uh, a, a kind of clearly post-colonial model of mm -hmm. undoing property. And even at that yeah. scale, of universality, it's hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a good moment to open. I'm sure there's questions in the audience. 
Hi, thank you for your lecture. Um, just one simple question, like um, the image you show before is very consistent, but the color is very, very vibrant. How you make the decision to use what color? Is it affected by project or like some research behind it? Like when you produce this kind of like image, what is the decision in this color and scheme palette? Um, I like these types of questions. Uh, <laughs> so when we were working on two markets, um, well, let me step back. The, the way we typically operate in the practice is, and also similar <laughs> with the pedagogy, is when we have a project, we start gathering a set of samples. And these are usually artists that we want to be in conversation with. And there were a series of artists from Ethiopia, contemporary artists, whose images we were basically responding to through each one of the drawings. Uh, but simultaneously, we it was also at a moment, and this is maybe a disciplinary kind of question, at a moment we graduated from grad school at a moment where everyone was doing these incredibly, incredibly detailed line drawings. And it was kind of a demonstration of labor um, and I think like, we were both frustrated with this idea that we give it value because it shows the amount of labor it required to produce. Versus the artists that we were looking at, we know that it required an incredible amount of thinking and effort, but it was never a demonstration of the labor. So we wanted to start engaging with that way of practicing. And um, one of the artists that we were really looking at, especially for um, two markets, was Ida Mulina, who's a photographer from Ethiopia. And she does these, these contrasting backgrounds, and the background always is embedded with some sort of cultural and political value. So for us, for each one of the, the drawings, there's a narrative that we wrote that is engaging, for example, with the one I showed about the history of Ujamaa. So all of the colors that we selected were either from the site or documents we gathered from Ujama. Um, so it's, it's somehow a combination of the two, but of course there's a lot of intuition as well. Um, but I would say, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're, we're trying to think about that very carefully now as well, and just really um, being inspired by, uh, yeah, like I showed Charles Gaines and the ways in which there's, there's an aspect to the process that you don't need to reveal, you know? And, and I think there's so much to two markets and immeasurability that is very difficult to talk about because it produced the thing we produced, but it doesn't need to be part of the discourse. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> Sorry. So when you talk about discourse with like artists and creatives from Ethiopia to create like these wonderful pieces, is there the same kind of process that goes into it as in like a discourse with the community when you're talking about building these residential buildings? Is there a similar type of discourse that goes on with the communities that they're being built for? It's what? Sorry? A similar type of discourse. The discourse last part. with the communities that these projects are being built for, or like even the art pieces that they're being made for. Um, the answer is as much as we can. We try. Um, the apartment building is a tricky one because it is in a particular neighborhood where all of the single-family villas are basically becoming apartments. So we know our three neighbors are gonna to be towers in the next five years. So there was kind of almost a six month long negotiation. Um, and it's hard to show in the images, but basically we had to decide, decide the percentage of opacity, which is something that is negotiable. Uh, so after we designed the facade, we had to negotiate with each one of the neighbors to figure out how much of their lot we get a view into or we get to see. Um, so that's always part of the practice. And, but when we go to, um, I want to be very clear, like we're not anthropologists, you know? So when we go and work on 
um, the marketplaces, it's mostly a collaboration with architects in those cities and artists in those cities. So we're not, we're not doing kind of uh, oral history or ethnographic work, but engaging with the documents that were produced before us and how we're responding to them. So almost all of the buildings that we drew were drawn before us, but they were drawn to represent a particular political agenda, and we're trying to somehow shift that. That is, for me, also very interesting because, in a way, you're not explaining what happens there, right? Like, there's something yeah. very different of the, the the work that these documents and these approaches do in your practice is not really about explaining. Mm -hmm. it's, it's something different, right? It's even creating a uh, lack of clarity about uh, mm -hmm. uh, them, right? Like, yeah. problematizing, uh, complicating the, the stories of these yeah. architectures that you're part of, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's interesting because the other day Raven Chacon was saying something similar, that uh, as, uh, as part of his engagement with indigenous practices, he understood that he should never explain what was happening, mm -hmm. that he, was, he, he would see his work as disposing it yeah. differently, but not really about providing a clear interpretation that could replace the reality. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of... That goes back to the earlier question around uncertainty, because I think there are moments where we want to explain, you know, because we're in these types of environments where we're presenting to people who don't know the space. But it always feels awkward, you know, it feels, I, I think to me, it's much more productive when we're impl implicating ourselves and the audience than pretending as if we are watching these people, right, or these, these spaces. So. But it is some, an urge that we have to fight because I think our training um, makes us want to explain, you know, uh, makes us want to make them transparent. Mm -hmm. um, thank you for the lecture. Uh, really compelling ways of thinking. Um, I think the conversation about property is like so evades disciplines and media. So even just thinking about property in terms of not the formal, but things that we own in terms of space, like yeah. personal space. We all have been trained to like take up our personal space in every seat or if someone is encroaching on your space. Um, so in terms of property as um, the right to own space, I think it's really, um, provocative way of engaging with architecture, um, with your background and your way of uh, thinking about space that maybe from childhood and the origin story that you were talking about, the land is something that is collectively uh, cared for as opposed to at the exclusion of other people, mm -hmm. it's mine. Um, so in terms of property and my space or space being owned, even temporarily. I wonder if you, like, um, how you think about um, engaging in spaces, like in this country and other places where it's accepted that space is owned and at the exclusion of other people. Uh, so as an architectural proposition, it seems that you're breaking down, like upending that. Um, and so I'm looking forward to seeing how you like undo the concept of at the exclusion of other people, uh, personal space, ownership of actual space. Um, it seems that that is like pulling the kind of thread out of this whole agreement that we have um, that is the subtext of architecture mm -hmm. in a lot of Western contexts. So just thinking about um, your foray into operating in those spaces and how you think your practice will like uh, up in that. Um, <laughs> not to put you on, it's just like, I think so upending um, the way yeah. that we agree that uh, spaces are owned by people mm -hmm. as an entry to architecture when it might not even be that definition. 
Yeah, I mean, one thing I, I just want to say is there are a lot of people thinking about this right now. And I think for us, um, it's been more about identifying fellow travelers. And a lot of those fellow travelers are actually not within our discipline. So finding ways to, to bring those ideas directly into architecture has been, has been the ambition of the work. There are people who can speak about this much more precisely <laughs> and coherently than I can, but um, just even engaging with that literature changed the way we thought about architecture. So it's something that we decided to commit to as, as an area of research. Um, but yeah, there are a lot of incredible minds out there that are writing about this, thinking about it, kind of unpacking the history of it in multiple contexts. Um, so we're not in any way alone. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, it's, um, but it is, it is challenging. I mean, how, how that applies to, the, like uh, Andres was asking, how that applies to the buildings we're designing. Uh, I don't know. But, but we're trying to figure it out. Thanks again, uh, just echoing what everybody else said. This is really fantastic. And um, I'm wondering, just given that midterms are around the corner, uh, what I really enjoyed so much about the work is actually, maybe this is like building what was just said, but like embracing architecture as a sort of dialogue practice and not a solution practice. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm, you know, again, I think what really struck me is again, the resolution of all the projects, but resolution in terms of like the presentation and the project itself as a project and not necessarily the singular solution. So at a time maybe when a lot of the students here are being asked for like an answer, I'm wondering maybe if you could sort of expand on the sort of, you know, how do you know like when it's a great project, even if the, the question is still unanswered? I mean, I, I think it's really fascinating. Um. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe the students should answer that, but <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I think we just need to find questions that will lead to a certain, a certain type of failure, you know, and, and I think that's the space to operate in because that will allow us to extend this conversation. Um, and at least the, the students that are collaborating with us this semester, um, they all felt that today. We had a pinup <laughs> where they presented their first ideas of a world after property, which is already ridiculous. Um, so, and then when you present that to an audience that, is, that has not been part of the conversation, then, then you begin to realize the limits of your ability to communicate those ideas and how it might translate to people uh, beyond these walls. Um, so yeah. There's three questions, one there, one there, one there, right? Um, I was hoping you could speak a little bit more about kind of the layered processes of image making as a response to colonial cartographies as you spoke about, but specifically the fact that you're trying to convey these messages in spaces, institutions that are largely produced by, the, by these colonial cartographies and in terms of that negotiation of space and aesthetic practice and through the lens of black aesthetic liberation. Sorry. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> CCCP. <laughs> yeah, I, I could have guessed. I could have guessed that. <laughs> That's a good disclaimer. Maybe you can start with that. Um, I, I really, I don't think there's an outside, basically. I think what you described as these institutions is the world right now. And um, if you want to rehearse how to dismantle those institutions from a space like this, or by being an activist and starting your own kind of community land trust, um, I think we're trying to operate towards a certain goal that won't lead to more removal and more dispossession. Um, but I think 
Yeah, like I think there are zones of intensity. Um, I agree with you, but but I think I don't think there's an outside. You know, I mean, and this is part of what I was trying to say with with the conversation around being an immigrant because. For me, whenever I was frustrated with the politics of this country, I would just, I used to be able to tell myself, I'll just go back to Ethiopia. And I think when you mature, you realize you go there and the same issues reappear in a different form. So I think just find multiple spaces to rehearse liberation and um, hopefully some of that will be useful. But yeah, there's, there's no outside. Yeah. We're in it. I want to get into a question about uh, your practice, since you spoke specifically about how your practice in creating architecture is inspired by looking beyond uh, property and you know questions of this kind of exclusion. In particular, I'm curious about if you could expand on this point about borders as um, you know exclusion versus borders as a place of meeting of different people. Um, and the reason for this is because I think while this is very possible to show in a way in graphic form or possibly in writing, um, we rather prefigure these functions into architecture when we get a client who wants us to, I mean, even the idea of clients already uh, maybe too prescriptive, but in practice anyway, the idea, we just wouldn't call those bo both of those things borders. We would just call those two completely different types of projects. So I'm curious if that, um, you know, when it comes what to- What are the two? Oh, uh, I think early in your presentation you mentioned the idea of borders as exclusion but, or as a limiting of movement versus mm -hmm. borders as a place of meeting. Um, and I, I just took this as one particularly interesting example because it seems like outside of here in terms of uh, school or outside of writing or outside of, you know, in, in terms of practice, we would just consider those two completely different words. Um, yeah. Sorry if that... Yeah. Sounds prescriptive, but I, I'm very curious. Um, so I'll say basically some of the things I, I showed today are ideas we're, we're just beginning to explore. Um, but we're trying to understand how these practices are multi-scalar. So when I showed the image of the African continent, it was an anthropologist who didn't want to draw the nation state boundaries, right? So in his mind, in his time, he was being radical. He was saying, I'm representing all of these different tribes throughout the continent, and that gives you a completely different image. But even in that representation, he wanted to solidify the edges. When we know, you know, like at least the ones that I'm familiar with, do not stay within that territory. Those things are amorphous, and you're constantly negotiating new territories. And depending on resources, you're moving to another place. So. I think just looking at that map, one was jarring for me because I've always seen the image of the continent with the national boundaries. And second, when I started thinking about it, I realized that doesn't go far enough, you know, because when you go into those environments, especially in, uh, in rural Ethiopia, um, the ethnic boundaries are incredibly contested, you know, and it's not a line, it's never a line. And, um, when, when we scaled it down and started thinking about at least, you know, the more pleasant experiences I had growing up in, in a Gibby and Addis and compound house, that was also a situation, even though there is a perimeter wall, it felt like the gate was always open. It felt like there were always people who were not part of the family in the house, you know. So we're trying to find a way to, to link these two scales. I don't know if I have the right language yet. But to me, that is not about policing edges. That is actually saying, we're going to produce different zones and those zones should be traversed by different people, right? So I'm not saying, um, yeah, I don't know what the word is basically. So it's, it's not, there needs to be a way in which we maintain difference between these zones while making sure that people um, are um, intensively engaging with one another. Um, and just to give you kind of the other extreme of it, you know, when I moved to Marietta, Georgia, there were no fences. But you would never step on someone else's lawn. It was scary. Like basically, the moment you see that line on the lawn because the neighbor 
mowed their lawn five days before you, that is the line you cannot cross. So the invisibility of that edge what also produced a more intense version of policing than the edge that I was familiar with where you know, the, the, the wall is there, but you're expected to cross it. So that's, that's kind of where, where we're, what we're trying to think about. Um, and I, I agree with you, we don't necessarily, especially uh, in architecture, we don't necessarily have the tools to really represent that. So I think that becomes an experiment and a search. Mm -hmm. Maybe find a question there. Hello. Oh. Um, first off, thank you for coming and thank you for your presentation. Um, I think your talk today and your work made me really think about storytelling and kind of almost like this myth-making, contemporary myth-making that you're doing um, just by capturing the storyline through like a variety of symbols and representations that might not literally exist but can kind of tell a story through the materiality. Um, and I just think it's really interesting as a person of diaspora how you're connecting such disparate landscapes in a way that has such a clear thread, like through the um, tapestry here with the, the Atlantic Ridge and the sand that you used to create Atlanta. It was kind of building this connection that I hadn't even thought about before in terms of the Atlantic slave trade and Atlanta as a space. Um, and I'm just curious to see, like, in what ways do you see that myth making or contemporary myth making as this kind of anti colonial resistance that usually treats history as something so rigid and, and um, rational and logical? Um, and just kind of how you see this representation in your work. Um, borrowing the symbols from a variety of myths or, or stories or, or kind of lessons that people can build from, if that makes sense. Um, so, I, I mean, disclaimer, I think, I, I don't know if I'm, uh, maybe I should check <laughs> with, with Mabel. Um, because she's, she's spent much more time thinking about uh, Sylvia Winter's work. But for me, like reading Sylvia Winter is eye-opening because what it helped me understand is that we need to find new origin stories in order to move forward. So part of the challenge is assuming that you have a particular origin story and that origin story is different from mine. So if we accept that all of it is constructed, then we need to be able to engage with those origin stories more critically and hopefully produce origin stories that produce different futures. Um, but I think storytelling is a big, big part of that project because it is the gravity. Basically, that's kind of fundamentally what's keeping us on the ground and that's also what's causing, you know, you can see what happened in this country with the 1619 project. When you begin to address the origin story, that's when people really lose their minds. So I think that's, those are the environments that we have to be willing to engage with as you know, people were thinking about the built environment. Because the built environment as it is right now assumes that there is a clear origin story. Well, thank you very much, Emmanuel. It was really amazing. Thank, thank you. you.